Integrity isn't a fixed commodity. Mm -hmm. It is something that we need to examine on a daily basis and a situational basis. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the, the, the pointy end of leadership, right? What is best for the company? Well, we, we need to cut costs, which one of the ways to cut costs is to let people go. But hang on, we promised these people a future. Mm -hmm. Where's your integrity? Is it to the board? Is it to your people? Yeah. And so resolving these ambiguity ambiguities rather you have to really look deep inside and when you've had one of these critical decisions that you've had to make and go well what do i do what is the right thing when you've really been put on the spot that's when you find your self-leadership that's when you find your integrity particularly when it's public so i said integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking but when you have to stand and say i think the right thing is this and the crowd says off with his head mm -hmm. that's the real challenge yeah. that's true integrity you tired of life just happening to you sick of your daily routine and want to experience real progress tired of cheap hacks and skeptical about anyone trying to give you their 10 cent motivation Welcome to the ABCs for Purposeful Living Podcast, the place that takes the bedrock foundational principles of success and breaks them up into smaller rocks that you can take and use for your own construction, as you build the life of your dreams the way that you want it. Stop living by default, get busy designing, let the podcast begin. David Thermer is an award-winning transformational life coach, leadership expert, and speaker. He's worked with over 100,000 people across 34 countries for the past 10 years, helping them to experience major change in their lives and to implement habits and rituals to ensure that the progress is lasting. Through his immersive seminars, live events, and coaching retreats, he makes you shake down your life, beliefs, and habits to their foundations in order to help you build a more intentional and powerful future. It's these foundations that he is bringing to you week by week in these podcasts, with the goal of helping you, wherever you may be, to get a hold of your life and turn it into something amazing. Welcome to the ABCs of Purposeful Living Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the ABCs of Purposeful Living Podcast. My name is David Thurmer and I'll be your host today, and I'm joined by a very exciting guest from Portugal. His name is Andrew Bryant. And Andrew Bryant is a global authority on self-leadership and leadership conversations. He is a well-renowned catalyst for change for the past 25 years at a global level. And he mainly speaks on being human while driving accelerated results through self-leadership. And he coaches executive leadership teams on how to function, on how to collaborate, and how to scale. He's written a book called Self-Leadership, How to Be a More Successful and Efficient and Effective Leader in 2012, which has been cited in over 140 research papers and PhD dissertations. And he's currently working on a new book, which is called The New Leadership Playbook, which is transforming the way that leadership conversations are being held today. And so I am so excited to get him here on the podcast because we are going to be talking about a subject that is very core and foundational to being a leader, and that is the subject of integrity. And so uh, there's nobody better to jump in on this subject than a man who talks about leading themselves. So thanks for joining us, Andrew, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Well, thank you, David. That uh, a stunning introduction. Uh, <laughs> but when you've been on the planet as long as I have, I guess uh, you you can you can grab a few uh, uh, scores on the on, on the scoreboard, as it were, or runs on the scoreboard. So, shoot, ask me any question you want, and let's see if I do know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you do. So, just tell me a little bit about your background for those of us who are encountering you for the first time. What made you uh, want to become a person who talks about leadership, especially self-leadership? 
Okay, well, that is a, that's a long runway. The very, very short version is, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm English by birth. And um, I went to an English grammar school and I was a good science student and I thought I'd become a doctor. And they merged my boys' grammar school with the girls' high school mm -hmm. just before my A-levels and I got distracted. I will leave it to your listeners and viewers to imagine why that might have been. And I didn't get into medicine, but I got into physiotherapy. And I thought I'd swap over after a year because the first year is anatomy and physiology. But I actually liked physiotherapy. In fact, I loved it because it's a very pragmatic science. It's, it's levers, it's physics, as well as the biology and the physiology. And the most important thing about self-leadership, which I've realized looking backwards, as it were, is it taught me the power of observation. Mm. When I worked with athletes or even you know, working with somebody who's disabled, you'd watch them, how they walked, how they threw a ball, how they kicked, uh, how they did a high jump, how they danced ballet. And you could, you could then work back from the observation to what are the driving forces. Some years later, um, getting involved in sports, I helped a, a sports team win a, um, a championship. And the company that sponsored that team, the managing director said, you helped my sports team win. Now come and work with my management team because they suck. And you know, I, I had a crisis of confidence, but I thought, well, you know, I have some skills in observation. Let me go see. And they let me sit on on the meetings. They let me sit in on some conversations. And having a, a blank sheet of paper, not, you know, years later, I took an MBA and, you know, thought about joining a consulting firm. Instead of coming in with the model in mind, I, I knew nothing except the ability to watch and listen. And I very quickly mapped out why the leaders weren't behaving the way the CEO wanted them to um, to behave because the system was encouraging them to behave in different ways. Mm. And that observational skill set me up. I went off to do an MBA to legitimize what I did, disagreed with one of my professors who thankfully said, hey, you've got some good ideas. Why don't you go do your research and write your own book? And the rest, as they say, is history. That is amazing. So you really have been all over the block. And well, what exactly then, in your point of view, because you've used this a few times, and I know you did a whole book on it, what exactly is self-leadership? Self-leadership is the practice of intentionally influencing your thinking, feeling, and actions toward your objectives. So deconstructing that, it is a practice. Mm -hmm. you know, the great Zig Ziglar, the motivational sales speaker of the United States, used to say, you know, um, motivation is like taking a shower. The effect is not permanent. Mm -hmm. Self-leadership is not permanent. We all have moments. I mean, I'm I'm married and every now and again, I'm, if I'm having a meltdown, my wife will say, go self-leadership yourself, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a practice of intentionally influencing your thinking, feeling, and actions towards your objectives. So the absence of self-leadership is very obvious. Right? The absence of self-leadership can be seen in terms of blaming, complaining, and a victim mindset. The self-leader says, I am responsible. I'm going to take ownership, and, and I'm going to take action. And, and with that mindset, they're at that point of choice. They have options. And options, um, as I'm sure you know in your own life, when you, when you make choices and you look for options, you find opportunities. Yeah, so that's actually pretty critical. And I, I really love that quote by Zig Ziglar, especially the one about uh, something that needs to be done daily and, and frequently something that has to be practiced. And I do think that self-leadership, why it ties in so well with integrity is because it's very easy to lead other people. But as the old proverb says, you know, it's easier to be a commander that takes over the city than the person who actually runs themselves. And a lot of times you find, especially if you, I think if you just to cite the research that Daniel Goldman did in his great book, Primal Leadership, the reason why most leaders, once they reach a certain place, end up sabotaging their teams rather than being able to take them forward is because they move into a place of dissonance where they are no longer managing their own emotional state and they're no longer working from a place of integrity that it actually starts causing problems at the overall organizational level with other people. And so it's super important, uh, it seems, for an individual to be able to manage themselves and to be able to have that sort of integrity where the things that they say and the actions that they take and the way that they live is consistent, which will then enable them to be a good leader of themselves, which will help them be a good leader of others. 
I agree. And I'd like to sort of create some distinctions around what you yeah. said. You said a lot of things. So, you know, there is a correlation between the effectiveness as a leader mm-hmm. and their own self-awareness. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, when we're when we're self-aware, we are more aware of others. And that's that's your point of the emotional intelligence research. You know, when you look at yourselves and, and you know yourself, you, you begin to become aware of your own projections onto other people, and mm-hmm. therefore you're able to see them more effectively. Yeah. Self-management or self-regulation is another core of self-leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to have awareness. You know, what are our triggers that put us into the zone of focus for productivity? And what are the triggers that you know will will send us down a deep dark tunnel or get us into a lot of trouble, right? You know, if uh, you know what is what is that post on Facebook that you are going to be triggered to respond to that you're going to spend the next six six days in a in a heated conversation, right? You know, or what is what is you know what is that tone of voice that is just going to send you insane? So the self awareness allows us to know where to self regulate, mm. and the ongoing development is the third part of self leadership, which is the self learning, mm. you know, either seeking feedback, which I, which um, Marshall Goldsmith coined as feed forward, or getting feedback, making those adjustments. the The piece about I don't know whether we uh, we we stop leading others. Um, when I speak about leadership, and by the way, the new leadership playbook is finished. It's out. It is published. It is in bookstores and Amazon and other online bookstores. Wonderful. Is that uh, in there? I talk about leadership as as like um you know a three legged stool never wobbles. And there are three parts to leadership, which is obviously the leader's style, the followers' motivation and and skill set, and the circumstance. Mm. And and if you do look at, re, so at leadership research, there's there's either sort of a contingent leadership or or, um, uh, or there's a situational leadership, and in a situational leadership, the the leader is invited to change their leadership depending on the circumstance and the and the the followers. Um, motivation and skill set. So the example I use is if we're all on an aeroplane and and the oxygen masks do fall from the ceiling. If the captain came out of the cockpit and said, ladies and gentlemen, I need to create some focus groups. I need your input in terms of what I should do. You know, at this point, even the atheists are getting religion, right? <clears throat> so, um, you know, that is not the time for, a, you know, an inclusive, participative or consultative leadership style. That is a time for a directive leadership style. Mm-hmm. But if you're the leader and you've got, you know, maybe you're you're leading a team of doctors or research scientists, you know, you're you're leading a bunch of people who are very good at what they do, mm-hmm. very competent, then you've got to lead them by participation and 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 collaboration, not by being directive. <clears throat> and of course, it's it's all circumstantial, right? What is, you know, who am I leading in what circumstance? And a lot of my writing these days is all about, you know, leadership is only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, which segues into our point about integrity, mm-hmm. is followership, mm-hmm. right? Leadership is actually, you know, um, a social psychological phenomena. Mm-hmm. When somebody sets an objective and people choose to follow, that's when leadership happens. Mm-hmm. You can't have leadership without followership. And followers, what is that magic? Why do we follow somebody? Because we believe in the vision and the values and the objectives. And at some level, it does something for us personally. And and that's when we get into the point of integrity. Would you follow somebody who doesn't have integrity? Mm. And I think you can ask me some questions about that because this is an interesting topic right here. Yeah, well, absolutely. So what does it take then for a person to have that integrity that makes people want to follow them, in your opinion. Okay. Okay. So simplest definition of integrity, I think that's out there, and correct me if you've got a different one, but is it's doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. Mm. Right. So so that speaks to an internal value system as as Covey talks about the compass. Right. Yeah. So doing the right thing when nobody's looking is integrity. I mean, we're all, you know, when we're being policed, when we're being observed, you know, it's, it, we, we tend to follow the rules because to not do so has obvious consequences. But when we're in private, we can get away with it. You know, that's when that self-awareness around our values happens. Mm-hmm. So if we're looking at leadership and followership, integrity is 
is about doing those things that the followers value as well as you value. Mm. Because typically when we talk about integrity, we assume it is, um, it's about doing good things. However, you could argue that various fascist dictators through, you know, in present and throughout history are actually in integrity. They are being true to the values that their followers have chosen to follow, as abhorrent as that might be to another group and demographic, mm. right? Um, so you would say, well, why would anybody follow him or her? You, you know, they're, they're an awful human being. However, they are in integrity with that value-based system. Mm -hmm. But that does seem to raise a little bit of a problem then working off that definition of integrity, right? It does. But, you know, people people take words like integrity and values as, as if they are fixed nouns, as if they are a construct. But we human beings, we're highly fluid. So I, I, I don't know whether you have a spouse, life partner, but let me ask you this question. You're driving along with, you know, your spouse, life partner, um, she or he's driving and you know the police turn up we 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 and they say um we think you were speeding were you speeding and your partner looks to you now where's your value and integrity is it to your partner to say oh no absolutely they weren't speeding or is it to the police officer to say well actually my partner was speeding mm. so now you've got a crisis of value Mm. You have an ambiguity mm. between, well, you know, where is my integrity? Is it is it with the person I care about? Is it with the police officer? What if the police officer doesn't have integrity? What if you weren't speeding and they said you were? And now you have this conundrum. So it is not as simple as people often make it out to be. Mm. We have cascading values. And again, the values can be contextual. Mm. All right. So in that situation, so let's let's flip that around. So you're driving and yeah. um, your life partner, you know, he or she, you know, looks over to you when you've been pulled over. And what do you do in that situation? What is integrity for you in that situation? Well, um, this is very specific for me because I'm married to a Brazilian. Mm -hmm. And there are cultural aspects with that. In fact, when I was dating my wife, very early on, she said to me, would you lie for me? And I was taken aback by the question, being British in, in, in upbringing. Um, I subsequently moved to Australia and then Asia, and now I'm Brazilian by wife. But when she asked me that, I was like, uh, well, it depends, you know, because being British and I had this very sense, strong sense of absolute right. And she, I paused and she said, wrong answer. I would bury bodies for you. Yeah. Right now, my wife has an extreme value of loyalty, which fantastic. You know, I have a life partner who's got my back in all circumstances. Now, the flip side of that is, you know, if I was to in any way stray outside of that marriage, I would be the one that is buried in the back of the garden. Right. So it's very clear. <laughs> but I'm fine with that. There's, 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 there's no ambiguity, is there? It's, it's an absolute. So integrity, as far as she's concerned, is absolute loyalty. So if you know if I was pulled over, right, my loyalty is to her more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what we're always trying to do as human animals is always working this algorithm to what is best possible outcome for myself and what is the best possible outcome for the tribe. Mm. Right. And if you've watched any of those shows where, you know, they're on an island or they're in a house and everybody votes each week on who gets thrown off. Yeah. If, you, if you're driving to win, you're going to get thrown out very quickly because the yeah. group's going to turn against you. Yeah. Right. If you do something wrong, the group's going to turn against you. But if you're too nice, somebody is going to throw you off. So you're constantly playing this. You know, your brain is doing this algorithm. So integrity isn't a fixed commodity. Mm -hmm. It is something that we need to examine on a daily basis and a situational basis. Mm. And, you know, at the, the, the pointy end of leadership, right, what is best for the company? Well, we, we need to cut costs, which one of the ways to cut costs is to let people go. But hang on, we promised these people a future. Mm -hmm. Where's your integrity? Is it to the board? Is it to your people? Yeah. And so resolving these ambiguity 
ambiguities, rather, you have to really look deep inside. And when you've had one of these critical decisions that you've had to make and go, well, what do I do? What is the right thing? When you've really been put on the spot, that's when you find your self-leadership. That's when you find your integrity, particularly when it's public. So I said integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. But when you have to stand and say, I think the right thing is this, and the crowd says, off with his head, mm -hmm. that's the real challenge. Yeah. That's true integrity. And there's a beautiful poem by Rudyard Kipling that I, I was was told to me when I was growing up as a boy. It's very English. Right? And it's, you know, when all those around are losing their heads and blaming it upon yeah. you, and you are a man, my son. So um, it, it, it's easy to say, do the right thing, and there's a set of values and a moral code. But if you've traveled, you understand that values are different in different countries, amongst different people, amongst different groups, and at different times. But when you really do the journey into yourself and you have self-awareness, when the push comes to shove and you go, do I have option A or option B, you know what it is. So what then do you use that as your guiding, let's say, principle or guiding value when you're looking at option A versus option B, if the consequences of that might be different when you're in one situation versus another situation? Well, as I said, it's a personal compass, right? It is. It is you know, first principle of, of, of COVID seven habits, isn't it? Is begin with the end in mind. Yeah. Is if I go out to the end of my life and look backwards, mm -hmm. how will I feel, you know, either on my deathbed or as they as I listen to my eulogy, how will I react to the decision that I made? Mm. I, that really puts it into context, right? A, a short-term gain, right? Um and there are things that don't matter, right? I mean, I've I've walked a couple of miles back to a shop because I I tapped my card, thinking I'd paid for the ice cream, and then I walked a couple of miles the other way, and, and this was a different city, and and I realised that it hadn't gone through, and I walked two miles back to say, you know, and it's it's a few euros, but but it mattered to me, yeah, right. So it, sometimes it's the very small things, and and. and there are you know there are speakers who will say what you do in small things you do in big things yeah um so those those are the ways that i think you do the deep dive into integrity and it's only when you get those ambiguous things um and you know there have been a case where you know the the right thing to do was to not say something Mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it let something go through and then nobody had to be disrupted and the outcome was there. But I had to go to the end of the thinking process because my integrity right at the moment, and I'm, I don't have to give you any context or story about this, everybody listening is going to be in that situation. Yeah. And there are other times when you go, gee, I wish I had made a stand. I wish I had stood up. I was recently... Um, running a facilitation for an executive leadership team, which is a lot of the work that I do around the world. And this is a new team, mm -hmm. established company, but new team because new CEO, um, a lot of the old executive leadership team had been let go, but there were a couple that remained. And the new team came in and they were being fairly bombastic. These are the changes we're going to make. And the, 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 the remaining members of the old team said, hang on a moment, you're ignoring a level of intellectual property. You're you're ignoring some levels of history. You're 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 judging how we did things, but you weren't here when we had the last CEO. You weren't here when we were in the last situation. You're ignoring those things, and you will ignore them at your peril. Mm -hmm. And the person that spoke up and said this, I said, look, I'm thank you very much for speaking up. That's fantastic. That enabled us to have a great conversation, move forwards. So that took great courage. He said, uh, no, a few years ago, I was in this position and I didn't speak up and the subsequent years were misery. So mm. I've learned my lesson. Mm. So it seems like it does take a little bit of time, though, because like I, I, one thing I, I you said in the beginning that I really resonated with is you became a master at observation through your years, and that's enabled you to actually take that step back and look at things from the outside. And when you're talking about looking to the end, looking to the final outcome of the decisions that you make, to be able to actually look into the future and work backward, that does take, uh, it seems like 
it's almost like a skill that you need to develop over time of actually looking at the end consequences of your decisions and to be able to actually literally project yourself into those unknown futures and see, well, is this, if I do make this choice, am I really going to be happy with where the outcome leads? And that is not really something that tends to come naturally to people because we're used to making so many decisions all the time. I think Daniel Kahneman was the one who said that the average human being makes about 25 to 30,000 decisions a day and 90% of them are made unconsciously. And if we were actually conscious of every single decision we make, we would hit decision-making fatigue, which is why the brain does delegate most of our decision-making to the area of the unknown. But a decision that's going to have ramifications for you down the road, you don't want to be made from the realm of the unknown. You want to become conscious to those decisions. So how does a person develop the skill to actually be able to think about their decisions in this context of, like you said, how is it going to impact down the road? It is a skill or it's a set of strategies and habits. Mm -hmm. right? So it is critical thinking. And I, I love that you brought up Daniel Kahneman. Uh, I, I mean, after years of studying unconscious bias, you know, he said, I'm still biased, right? Yeah. And there are other psychologists and sociologists, in fact, the majority of them are now saying we have almost none, if any, free will, because, you know, we are the result of the algorithm of our DNA and, our, and you know, our time, place, birth, our parents are upbringing, our early schooling, and you know, one of the things I always do if I'm speaking to an audience is, you know, in a particular country, you know, if I'm sw in Sweden, I say, hands up, who's proud to be Swedish? And everybody puts their hands up. And anybody who doesn't put their hand up, I say, oh, you must be the Norwegians. Right? So because, <laughs> because nationality My wife's Swedish. Is that, 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 that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> Well, it doesn't. I could I could have picked any country in the world. I mean, Irish and English, or French and English, or Malaysians and Singaporeans. It it yeah. doesn't matter. You know, nationality is an accident of birth, and yeah. yet because we're born into our nationality, anybody who critiques our nationality, who is not of our nationality, is immediately fighting talk, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and yet it's a discussion. It's just an accident of birth, right? So this this self-awareness to step back from what I call the framing, the framing of our birth and our upbringing is to step back from the frames. It is impossible to step back from all the frames all the time. As you said, you would get decision fatigue. And so we habituate and the, the awareness is to, to begin to notice what are the decisions that are going to require our integrity. Mm -hmm. Certain things are going to be, you know, I mean, you know, do I have, you know, do I have ice cream or apple pie after dinner or do I have bugs? Well, you can get into a pattern. If you're in a diet, you're going to get, I'm not going to have either. If you, if you want, if you're, you know, if you value the culinary, you're going to ask what is the best. You're going to get into a habit of asking the questions about the decision. Mm -hmm. It's recognizing, firstly, do is it my decision to make? It's step one in every decision making. Do I have the authority to make this decision? Because yeah. if you don't, well, you're stymied. But if I have the authority to make the decision, is this a small decision or is this a big decision? If it's a big decision, what do I know and what don't I know? And that last question, what don't I know about this decision, is what causes us to step back. Mm -hmm. What don't I know about this decision? And what are the consequences? And the zoom out um you know, sometimes called the balcony view, which is, you know, if if you're dancing with somebody on a dance floor at a high school dance, for instance, you know, if you're dancing with somebody, your your awareness of, is of yourself, that person and maybe the music and the couples immediately beside you. But if you zoom out to the balcony, you can watch the pattern of the couples dancing upon the floor. Yeah. Right. And you become aware of the people standing around the edge and at the bar and all those sorts of things. But there's a third level, which is the rafters view. If you zoom out one more time and you're sitting on the beams of the seat, you know, of the of the roof, looking down at yourself on the balcony, looking down at yourself on the dance floor, you become aware of what are the frames of mind that you are using to evaluate the thing in the first place. Mm -hmm. When you start to become aware of your own biases, your own prejudices then that gives you the awareness. Um, I have a story that that, that demonstrates this. Um, and I don't look very good in this story, so I kind of hate telling it. But it, it for me, it was, a, it was a revolution that I had a bias. Mm. And 
Um, I broke a tooth in France on my way back to Singapore. Um, I, I broke my tooth on a baguette on Bastille Day because it was a stale baguette from the day before. <laughs> and um, so I had a broken front tooth. I was flying back to Singapore on the fo- following. Uh, on, I would arrive in Singapore on the Sunday. And um, on the Monday, I was flying off to Vietnam to do some speeches in Vietnam. And I'm missing a front tooth. And I looked ridiculous. So I called my secretary from France and I said, uh, you need to find me a dentist in Singapore on Sunday night. Um, and, and that is your mission. And there is no refusing that mission. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, when I got to Singapore, she said, yeah, you got an appointment 10 night uh, with this dentist. Um, and so I, I go to this uh, dental clinic and, and I sit in the waiting room and the, the name on the door is Mohammed Rashid, Rashid Abdullah. And I'd, live in, I'd lived in Asia for 17 years. I didn't think I had any bias whatsoever in terms of where somebody's been. I visited India and Pakistan and, and Indonesia and Malaysia. I didn't think I had any bias around it, but I just noticed the name. Then Rashid comes out and he says, oh, how are you doing? And he had a London accent, which is where I'm from. And I felt myself relax with the familiarity of his accent. Mm-hmm. which meant if I relaxed, I had a bias towards people with an English accent, which meant there must have been an unconscious bias about where he'd come from. His family were from Pakistan. They'd moved to England. He was born in England, grew up in England, educated in England. So it's like English dentistry, which probably should be a negative bias. But anyway, but it was just in that moment, I'm like, I was annoyed at myself that I'd had some judgment because I always think I'm really inclusive. But clearly I wasn't. Mm. And we all have those, right? Just somebody's yeah. name or their gender or the way they're dressed. We've, we've created that first impression bias. Yeah. And it, and the moment you find out that was wrong, it should be a red flag to go, I need to get better at pausing before I make the judgment. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? You know, and it, it's that gap between stimulus and response, isn't it? As the, the skill or the habit, the strategy is as much as possible to extend that gap between stimulus and response. Yeah. And when we do that, then we can ask the question, am I operating in integrity? Yeah. Am I being true to my values? Is the outcome of this action and decision going to be aligned with being the best version of myself? Because that's all self-leadership is. We're, we're practicing this to be the best version of ourselves, right? I'm currently version 6.1 of myself. Next month, I have a birthday and I become version 6.2. If I look back, version 6.1 is a lot better than version 4.1 mm-hmm. or 2.1 even. I mean, 2.1 was was young and healthy. <laughs> version 6.1 is a bit slower. But the wisdom that I have at 6.1 allows me to make these decisions. So as long as we're progressing and growing, I think we can cut ourselves some slack when we make those mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Because because as long as we, as long as we learn and we don't just keep repeating. Them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like that you brought up that story. I mean, even as you said, it doesn't paint you in a good light. I think that story actually is something that people will find helpful because it's actually one of the most natural biases out there. I'm not sure if you've read much of uh, Robert Sapolsky's work. Uh, Robert no, Sapolsky wrote a book called Behave. And in the, his book called Behave, he talks about how every action, um, what stimulated it you know, a few seconds ago, a few hours ago, a few days ago, a few years ago, a few millennia ago, a few um, ages of the universe before. And what he does is he's one of the world's foremost biologists, and he basically traces the biological path. And so he actually has an entire chapter on why we naturally have biases towards people of a different color than us, or people of a different uh, gender than us, or people with different names for us, just because it is it's actually something that's hardwired in our DNA from our pre-human days. But so oh. if many people will have situations like this where they will catch themselves and kind of say, oh, yeah, that's terrible of me for feeling that. And I think it's good that you actually were able to catch yourself in that because that's where the progress is made. Like you said, when you're able to actually observe yourself and feel that, hey, this does not align with what I would want to be. Hey, this is not the kind of person that I want to become. 
realizing that you're in a moment where you're not displaying the best version of yourself or the version of yourself that you know probably would have resonated with 2.1 but definitely not with 6.1 and if this is what you need to develop to 6.2 then i guess that awareness also and that ability to opt to observe and then say all right let me learn from this let me grow from this let me acknowledge this and let me use this to become a better version of myself through observing and through developing that self leadership i think that puts you in a much better place than the person who goes into it thinking that well this version of me is great i've mastered everything i'm in line with all of the most important things about me and then they use that to kind of almost be in denial about stuff that comes to their attention but no that couldn't be me because well i'm a person of integrity or oh that couldn't be me because i actually value this kind of stuff yeah i mentioned i spent 17 years in asia and there's another value word very similar to integrity and that's humility mm -hmm. and when i first moved to when i first moved to asia my friend said andrew you're moving to Asia, you're going to need to learn to be humble. And I said, well, how arrogant do you think I am? And they said, no, no, you're not arrogant, but you're confident. And the Asians can misconstrue confidence as arrogance. And I went, oh, well, that's an interesting perspective. And I found it to be true. Um, I you know, was constantly needing to dial things down a little bit. So I did some research on, on humility and, and Angni, um, she wrote a paper in 2000 around humility, and she looked at six aspects, but you can summarize it in two, that mm -hmm. humility is, is having an accurate, neither overestimated nor underestimated view of your own ability, right? Um, as as the, the, the American philosopher, um, uh, entrepreneur Will Rogers said, if you've done it, it ain't bragging, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, have an accurate view of your but the other aspect that people who say they're humble, oh, we're so humble, is the ability to consider somebody else's perspectives as equally valid as your own. Mm -hmm. Now, you now the word humility comes from the Latin humilitas, which is ground, grounded, right? Mm -hmm. Which you know, so so humus is that is is dirt, right? So we need to be grounded, and if we're grounded in our self awareness and our values and our intentionality to have integrity. Then we can we can consider somebody else's perspectives. We can say, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a different way to look at this, and that makes you a great leader. So, you know, leaders need to you know generate that fellowship. I'm I'm circling back to the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. And and, and great leaders are looking for what are the talents and the ideas within my group, rather than this is my way or the highway, which will work up to a certain point, and then yeah. That's end of story. Okay. I, I don't know whether it dates me a little bit, but the original Star Wars um, TV show with Jim Kirk uh, played by William Shatner and, and Spock played by Leonard Nimoy and, and Dr. McCoy, and I'm afraid I can't remember the actor's name. That would be Star Trek, um, right? Yeah, the original. Did I say Star Wars? Yeah. I, I meant Star Trek. <laughs> Give me, I, I know that. Well, that's terrible. I'll get shot for that. Um, the original <laughs> not Star on my Trek watch. series. Right? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, not on my watch. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, the original Star Trek is kind of funny because um, it, it was absolutely cutting edge at the time. It had the first interracial kiss between, um, and and it had a whole bunch of stuff. But it's kind of interesting that you've got the logical Spock and the emotional McCoy, yeah. and you've got Kirk often wrestling with integrity issues mm -hmm. and and it's 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 tv and it's funny but i've watched some of those episodes and so they, they turn up on my youtube feed from time to time and he, there's there's you know there, there's kirk struggling with these things you know what is the right thing to do so we can sometimes learn a lot from you know from from poetry or drama or or, or theater or movies um, the, the West Wing, um, the, the the TV series about um, uh, you know, the presidency, you saw a president there wrestling with mm -hmm. two sides. You know, um, not a bombastic president who, who who knew everything, but a but a president who was trying to find the right path. So there are some role models in fiction and in reality that we can take. Who is a person that I look up to? And if you if you have a mentor in your life and you say, you know, I've got this difficult decision, can you help me work walk, walk through it? Um, that's another way of reinforcing these skills. Doing it by yourself 
uh, eventually you develop the skills, but early on, you, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So having a, a coach, a mentor, um, a very good friend who can be quite analytical and help you think it through. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that reinforces the self-awareness. And then over time, you get better at that. Oh, for sure. And I, I love what you said when you said that you can kind of learn a lot of these things from like TV shows and from movies and from great characters from there, because that's really the way that human beings have been doing it from the beginning of time. I mean, all our greatest stories and all our greatest legends and even all our greatest religions at some point started of ways of providing examples to ourselves of the ideals that we wanted to embody. Basically, if there was an ideal that our group found was the most important thing, here is the story about this character who embodied it and by seeing them uh, go through the struggle that they faced and actually come up with that decision, what that does is that allows us to actually place ourselves mentally in their struggle so we can learn from what they did without having to make those mistakes for ourselves. And so from the beginning of time, as a way of kind of helping us to model and embrace some of those things, we had those stories and allowed ourselves to learn from those great examples. And then also one thing that I, I love that you brought up is the ability of taking on a mentor. I mean, that was another thing that always there there from generations past was once you reached a certain age and you had kind of grown up on those stories and grown up on those values and grown up on all these greater examples, it was time for you to start venturing out into the world and making some of these decisions for yourself and setting yourself up to make some of these mistakes for yourself as well. But you never went at it alone. You went at it with a mentor. You had an apprentice. You know, you had the old man of the village or you had the matron of the tribe who you were with. And then that person actually helped helped you to learn how to develop your skills, to enact your values in the world, to kind of hold your hand and champion your cause until you reached a place. And so I think that's kind of been lost nowadays where people sort of have this concept that everything is intrinsically in you right away and you should be good at something the first time you do it you should know how to act in every single given set of circumstances but sometimes it's so great to have somebody alongside us who we can talk to who can just just kind of bounce ideas off of and almost be like a mentor for us or a coach for us or a consultant for us as we are trying to like you said move up through the various levels to become the person we want to be Yep. Um, and you, know, you, could, you could have a mastermind group as well if you, know, you have some trusted people. Look, the world's best militaries mm -hmm. debrief every mission, successful or otherwise. Right? Typically, we hear about the debrief when something goes wrong, right? You know, there, yeah. there's, a, there's an inquiry. But we, the best military, uh, they, they, they sit everybody down, what went right, what went wrong, what can we learn from this? Yeah. And it, it's essential that we, we get in this habit of deconstructing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So we tend to agonize over those decisions that we made wrong. Um, I, for some of my research, interviewed a lot of very successful people. And I interviewed somebody who was a very successful trader. I mean, he, in any days, millions of dollars, you know, were, were put or taken or stocked or what I can don't even understand it most of the time. You know, he he made you know many, many decisions in a day worth millions and millions of dollars. And he said to me, if I lose a bunch of money on a on a day, on a trade, I am going to go through that with a fine tooth comb and find out, you know, what what was the premise, what was the decision that we made, you know, what was the data we had, why did we make a mistake? Yeah. But he said, if I make a lot more money than I expected, I do it even more so because there must have been a bias be built into that that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Now, typically, if you made more money than you expected, you'd do a little dance of joy yeah. and your ego would be going, you are amazing. But he yeah. had trained himself to go, you made too much money on this. <laughs> there was something you didn't account for. Otherwise, you'd have known you were going to make this much money. And yeah. that thing that you didn't account for could cost you next time. Go look for it. And and I, I I took that away and I went oh wow yeah um, you know we've all beaten ourselves up over the things that we did badly but do we in the celebration of the things that we did well go well what did I do that led to that great result and then that reinforces your decision making and you know also factors in dumb luck <laughs> yeah exactly. 
because you really want to get those same results over again. I mean, who who mm-hmm. is it? I think it was um, Jim Ron who said that both success and failure are never cataclysmic one-off events. They're always the result of repeated actions that get take place over a series of time. The problem is that people don't know how to see that series of process through time, that when either the big success or the big failure happens, it's always like, wow, that was something big that we never expected. Well, the the piece of wisdom I would share with your listeners and and, and viewers is this, is that you, whilst self-leadership is the practice of intentionally influencing your thinking, feeling, and actions towards your objectives, they are your actions. Yeah. It was your decision. Yeah. But you are not your actions and yes. you are not your decision. Yes. And that separation is really hard to do because mm. – you know, we feel like, and particularly if it happens in the public sphere and we get labeled as such, we feel like we are our actions. However, we took an action, but we as a human being, this, this is the core of self leadership have the ability to learn from that and to upgrade, to be a better version of ourselves and say, hey, I did that. It was a mistake. So uh, sometimes it can be your greatest learning. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I have a, a colleague who... Um, went to jail for murder, and um, it, you know it, the, the story. I'm not even going to say it here. You know there was a rationalization, but basically he killed his girlfriend's drug dealer, um, and he went to jail for murder. But guess what he did? He did his PhD in psychology whilst in prison, hmm. and he came out of prison and is doing great work with the rest of his life. He served his time, so you know he he was not a murderer but he did commit a murder. Um, and that's an interesting distinction, isn't it? Because you would yeah. say, well, a murderer, he is a murderer. No, he committed a murder, but he's not somebody who set out to be a murderer, right? <laughs> and, you know, in, in fact, at the moment that he committed, the, you know, he, he ended that person's life, perhaps you could argue that he was an integrity. So it is not as cut and dried as we think it is. And I think, you know, we we need to take a breath before we're judgmental. It is so easy to be critical and judgmental, and I'm sure that is also hardwired into us to to judge people. Yeah. But you know, we know that there's an attribution bias. We judge other people much harsh, harsher harsher than we judge ourselves. I mean, if somebody's late to my meeting, I'm like, why couldn't you? Res- you know, you're disrespecting me and everybody else here. You're late to my meeting, but have I been late to a meeting? Absolutely, but I had just cause for being late. Yeah, that's attribution bias. It is. Yeah, it's a negative, exactly. right? So, yeah, I mean, being integrity is to perhaps sometimes give other people up to a point. The benefit of the doubt around, well, what was their value system before we jump to judgment and ask, you know, what, you know, what was causing you to make that decision? Um, what was the decision you made? What was the positive intention? And particularly if you're working in a team in, a, in, in, in an organization, is, is to ask that, what was your intention in that? Because often people try and do the right thing, yeah. um, but the outcome is horrific. Um, I I had a friend who came down one morning and the kitchen was a disaster. There was flour everywhere and there was butter melted and and it was just a disaster. And Mm -hmm. he yelled at his kid and his kid burst into tears and said, but I want to do something nice and make you breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how bad are you going to feel, right? Um, Positive intention, horrific execution. But if we destroy the positive intentionality, we'll get no execution. Exactly. Yeah. And I think I think that's a very good point that you brought up, because I know that this was a conversation I had with someone a little time back. They were talking about the origins of the word judge. And the word judge actually comes from an old Greek word, which basically meant to grade. So it, to, to kind of look between the two and say, OK, out of these two, which one do I generally think is better? And so as human beings, we are hardwired for that sort of decision, because that's what we have to do daily to judge our actions, to evaluate our choices that we have. We have to grade them and to see out of everything that we have, what is the best possible choice to make? The thing is, though, when it comes to judging or grading the actions of others, like you so rightly said, we don't have access to all that information. We don't see all the process of choice that they went through to come 
come up with that. And if we judge the action too hardly, then we kill the intention behind it. And what if the intention behind it was something that was actually really great? And so, like you said, once again, that does take the time and opportunity and require us to just take a little bit of that step back to widen the distance between the trigger and your response to it, to widen the difference between what you see and how you respond to just practice a little bit of thinking. And, and like you had so rightly said, what do you know about the situation and what do you not know? And what you do not know, that is, I think, one of the best questions that you could ever ask yourself, because as you also brought up, it puts you in a place of humility. And uh, that humility enables you to look at others and to see that you don't have all the information, but things that you do not have um, access to could actually be even more essential to your understanding of the situation than what you do have access to. And so just to, to summarize, because I know that we're getting to a point of time, and I think this is a good place to kind of bring things together. I think one aspect of integrity, I love the definition that you gave it, by the way, and I think that's a beautiful definition. My definition of integrity that I've always kind of gone ahead on was structural integrity. You know, you build a building, you build a bridge, everything's got to be in structural integrity, like everything's got to fit into place. And if it's not, then the building kind of topples over. But the interesting thing is that when you are consistent with your words and your thoughts and your actions, then what you do is from a place of integrity. And so just bringing these two definitions together, I feel that there is a learning for each and every one of us to take stock of our words, take stock of our actions, and to do so from a place of observation, to do so from a place of thinking, to do so from a place of, well, what am I doing right now that is going to have an impact down the road? What do I know? What do I not know? What do I still left, have left to learn? What have I not considered? What do I have? What information do I have access to and what do I not? And to put ourselves in that space of humility, to realize that there are certain things that we do not know. There are some things that we are predisposed to observe because of other biases that we may have. And the way that we enact what's right in this situation may be different than the way that we enact it in another situation, depending on that context. And I think a sensitivity to and an awareness around that will help us to each, I think, be, in your very profound words, be good leaders of ourselves, to practice some self-leadership, to have a bit more grace, a bit more patience, and also a bit more intentionality with the people that we work with to give them that space to follow us. Because we, at the end of the day, if we want to lead people, we want to motivate people, we want to actually see some good happening in our homes, in our families, in our companies, and in our world, we need to give people reasons to follow the great thing that we have set out for them. And I think a lot of that comes down to what we've discussed. So before we leave, Andrew, I thank you so much for your wisdom. Is there uh, some parting words of wisdom for some practical ways that our listeners can take this forward? Be the best version of yourself and just recognize it is an evolution, right? So, you, yeah. so you know, your, your summary was spot on, but as I listened to your summary, it did seem like a lot to do. And I, I can imagine people go, well, it's a lot to do. And it is a lot to do. Being human, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like we're taking a test we didn't study for. Yeah. You know, we, we get birthed. And there is no instruction manual. There are people who will say this is the book of instructions, um, but I just I, I'm a bit skeptical about that. I, I think that it is very much an iterative process, and we learn it as it goes. So be kind to yourself, and and but have that positive intention to constantly be striving to be the best version. Visualize that. What would be the best version of yourself? And just spend a little bit of time each day, each week, in the shower, wherever you have your moments of reflection and think, well, what would be the best version of myself? And if you keep asking that, I think you will build your integrity and certainly you will develop your self-awareness and your self-leadership. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, not only asking that when things go the way you want it, but also asking when things don't go the way you want it. 
or when things go even much better than you actually expected. You know, and it's not just having your brief before you go in and do it, but then it's also taking that debrief later. Okay, so why did I get the results that I wanted? Because what that does is then that causes you to actually start bringing that part of your thought into the conscious element. To go back to Daniel Kahneman, that starts allowing those decisions to become a more conscious element for you, which will then, I think, enable you to make better decisions as you go forward. And so you, as you so rightly said, I called it a skill and you said, no, it's, it's a habit and a practice. And I think that's absolutely true. I think as people make it a daily habit and a daily practice, they get better at this. So can you give people a good first step to start taking when they get off this well, call now and they go and... Well, go, go check out self go check out selfleadership.com mm -hmm. um that's my website and there's there's different paths for different people you'll you'll be able to find out more about self leadership and uh and from there you can go to my youtube channel and there's some videos you can watch and i you know start the process um I'm, I, I, well continue the process because if you're listening to this podcast if you're watching this you've already started the process and you're you're just looking to shortcut the strategy. Everybody's road is different. And, you know, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody says, oh, well, this is the way to do it, I would treat them with a great deal of skepticism. Yeah. I would, you've got to find your own path. You will find guides along the way. And, and hopefully David and I have, have given you a nudge in the right direction, but you have to walk this path. So, you know, take what is useful, discard what is not, but add what is intrinsically yours. And, and make that a life practice. Um, and uh, I, I promise you that you will live a more rich, but mostly a more conscious life. Absolutely. And as Andrew so rightly said, it's good to do this along the way with a mentor or with someone that you can look up to and who can actually help you in these areas. So um, I would say definitely do that. Go get the go get his book. Go visit his website, Self Leadership. At the same time, also visit his YouTube channel and whatever this podcast has inspired you to do. I ask that you go and take intentional action forward. So thank you so much, Andrew, for being here with us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you to all the listeners who have been here with us. And I look forward to seeing you all again very soon on another episode of the ABCs of Purposeful Living podcast. Until then, take care. And this is David and Andrew signing off. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us today on the podcast. Please do subscribe for more. If you found this helpful, please share it with someone else. Pass the help along. David is always eager to hear from you and would love to work with you in a more hands-on way. For more information, please visit our website at www.davidtheramer.com. That's www.davidtheramer.com.